Before we begin this week's reading, I'd like to thank my Patreon supporters. Hello, it's Ren Presents Time. I'm your host, Ren, and today we continue with the Shadow Tech Goddess, Part 2, Chapter 6, Buzzed. Very distressing development in the last chapter. Paymaster Stenstrom and Lady Gwendolyn determined to their horror that the, their adversaries aboard the George Parr have somehow figured out that Magravine was their intended destination as the George Parr is parked right over Magravine. They figure out that Hannah Ben Sherlamp played the trick on them where she took all the artifacts from the Vith Museum at Sir Fortnum College hoping that they would steal the ones that they needed and that one had a Magravine connection so she knows that's where they gotta go in their quest to discover Ing. There's no What's at Magravine? She just knows Magravine's there. And there's George Parr, her whipping boy, just sitting there. He decides to wise up and use fleet decorum against Captain Duval, calls up his daddy, and has him come and fetch the George Parr on a pointless... Well, I'm sure it's pointless, not pointless to somebody, but a science expedition to the Hearts Field in far off space. So they're gone. And then they get a calm from the George Parr, expecting it to be from his father, as they had sent a, an armed contingent aboard the ship to make sure that Captain Duval doesn't try to murder any of his crew. Because that, that's a thing that could happen. But hearken, it's the Lacerta, and she brain buzzes Gwendolyn right through the calm. The sisters can do things like that. The sisters are incredibly powerful. They don't let anyone see that out on the streets as people would start to fear for their freedom because the sisters are actually the ones in control of the league. They have a exclusive playground in the middle of nowhere in Remnath called Samarkand and it's no one's allowed to go within like 50 miles of it because the sisters let themselves go when they go to Samarkand it's to reward themselves for good behavior when they're there they do all kinds of crazy things not necessarily PG rated so yeah but the Lacerda doesn't have these problems. She doesn't need to go to Samarkand to let her hair down. She's just going to do it wherever. And she can reach out and touch you right over a calm screen. That's the power of the sister's TK. Gwen is in bad shape, bleeding out the ears. Aram and Alesta appear. And Alesta promises to help Gwendolyn as they can't seem to find Morgan. So, let's proceed Immediately, shall we? Part 2, Chapter 6, Buzzed. It was like plunging into a cave, going into the Marians area. Triple bulkheads, no lights, and no tech made it unnaturally quiet. One would never know one was deep in the bowels of a star-faring ship. Following Alesta, Stenstrom shuffled through the flickering, lantern-lit confines of what once was Cargo Hold 3. They moved quickly through the narrow streets. As they went along, Alesta pulled various people from what they were doing and bade them follow. Soon, a small shuffling gago followed them through the hold. They got to a small barn and entered. Stenstrom lay Gwendolyn down in the soft straw and backed away. The Marians Alesta had gathered assembled around her. I'm sorry, Belle. You need to wait outside. You too, Rami. I love you, but you must give us some space, she said, and then knelt down. Stenstrom and Aram backed out of the barn, and a Marian lady slid the door shut with a grating clunk. The handkerchief Aram had been holding to Gwendolyn's ear dripped with blood, deep red. He dropped the bloody thing, and it lay there on the metal floor, dusted with straw. Ominous. 
They waited outside the barn in the semi-lit dark. It seemed like they waited a long time, sitting on the straw. At last, the barn door slid open, and a Marian lady came bustling out. Ma'am? Stenstrom asked. Ma'am? But the lady just hurried along, not answering. She disappeared around a corner. A few minutes later, she returned with two other ladies. They were carrying several large baskets. Ma'am, please, Stenstrom said. But again, she and the others ignored him and went in, sliding the door shut behind them. More time passed in the flickering dark of the hold. Eventually, Tara emerged in the lantern-lit gloom, escorted by a Marion. Bell, how's Gwen? she asked. Don't know. They're in there. Tara looked at the rough wooden planks of the barn. I think she's all right. Stenstrom took heart. The Molly just tell you that? No, just a feeling. She flopped down next to him on the straw. Sure is peaceful in here, Tara said, looking around. Like being in a cave. I've got a little bad news, Belle. Seems the day for it. What is it? Morgan. She's gone. Gone? Where'd she go? She left the ship this morning. She packed a few things and took a rip car off. I guess she was pretty mad finding out about you and Gwen. Guess where she went. Please tell me she's safely down at the fleet or at a hospitaller sanctum somewhere. She went to the George Parr before they broke orbit. I don't know why, but that's where she is. Stenstrom felt a headache coming on and a wave of worry for Morgan. He rubbed his forehead. I'm sorry she felt that way. Morgan is loved here. She knows that. I just... He took a breath. I had to make a choice. What was I supposed to do? That certainly doesn't mean I don't want her here. Tara turned to Aram. That device you have, the one with all our names on it, is that really how it is? That there are really lots of different Bells and lots of different Gwens and Mees too? Aram nodded. I've seen it myself. There are probably many, many more out there that didn't make the list. These eight are important, for whatever reason. And me? Did you see me out there somewhere with Bell? Aram hesitated and then nodded. I did. You're very different, Tara. You're... What? I'm what? Do you really want to know such things? I do. Then walk with me. Aram and Tara got up and walked off into the gloom, leaving Stenstrom alone by the barn door with his troubled thoughts. When they returned several minutes later... Tara was all smiles. She sat down next to Stenstrom and seemed rather giddy. She gave him a pat on the cheek. Sounds like fun. I'm good with it. Good with what? All the sex we're having out there in an alternate universe. You and me doing it left and right. And that prospect doesn't trouble you? No. No, I'm good. Fine. Tara, I want to break orbit. File a flight plan to the kills with the fleet. And begin a standard patrol. I want some distance from Kana and Professor Sherlamp. That ought to keep her puzzled. She stood and brushed herself off. I'll bet we haven't seen the last of that crazy Lacerda woman. She's going to be tough to deal with, Belle. Stenstrom agreed. Good. I'm not done with her either. Go on, Tara. Let's get underway. I'll inform you of Gwen's progress as I find out more. Okay? Okay. She gave him an affectionate pat on the head and then turned and walked away. What did you tell her, Aram? Stenstrom asked. I told her some strange things, Bell. All true. Before Stenstrom could ask more, the door slid open. A Marian girl peeked out. My lord, please come in. Please, she said. Stenstrom felt his heart beating with dread now that the moment of discovery was upon him. Was Gwen alive or dead? The girl's tone had given away nothing. And if she was alive, was she hopelessly brain-scrambled? Mouth dry, he entered with Aram following close behind. Gwen lay on the straw at the far side of the barn. Several Marians leaned over her. They had removed her uniform. She was in a white Marian nightshirt that went down to her knees. Her uniform, boots, and other small garments like socks and knickers were folded neatly nearby. Her watch sat atop the stack. Gwen's fedula was leaning in its scabbard against the barn wall. He glanced at it, noticing fingerprints on the scabbard. Gwen's fingers left those marks. Gwen, whole and unharmed. She must be incapacitated. She would never allow herself to be removed of her uniform and boots in a public setting. Gwen was such a proud woman. Alesta sat by Gwen's head, holding her hand by the wrist. Wait, where's her head? Stenstrom was shocked. For a moment, he thought she had no head. It seemed replaced, but with some sort of 
empty space where a head should be. As he neared, he discovered her head was actually submerged in a deep glass bowl filled with a slightly bluish fluid. The bowl was recessed on one side, allowing Gwen's head and neck to recline easily into the depths of the bowl without tipping it over. And Gwen's entire head was submerged, mouth, nose, everything. Her rich chestnut brown hair flowed out in a mass. Alesta turned and reached out. Belle, come here. She sounded serious. He sank to his knees and sat next to her. She took his hand. That was a real lick that Lacerda put on her bell. She was going to die, sure enough. He looked at Gwen's still form, unused to seeing her in a Marian nightgown. The future Countess of Belmont, South Tyrol. Here she was, her head in a bowl. He took her limp hand and choked up a little, feeling suddenly hot in his HRN. Is she going to be all right, Alesta? What's her prognosis? I don't know. The next few hours will tell the story, Bell. This water comes from a place that we know of far away on Trimble. It has amazing properties. It can be breathed in without fear of drowning. It speeds healing and aids in recovery. She'll need to stay like this all night to allow the water to perform its work. Then, once she begins stirring, we'll know how much damage the Lacerda did to her. Aram sat down next to Alesta. There's really not much more we can do except wait it out. He glanced over at her watch. May I put her watch back on? She's not taken it off since I gave it to her. Perhaps it'll help at a spiritual level. Certainly. He got the watch and gently put it back on her wrist, fussing with the clasp, trying not to make it too tight. There, Gwen. I've given you your watch back. He sat there, holding her hand. Alesta gave a bright smile. Why don't we go get some lunch? It's a making day in the mess, and that's not to be missed. There's nothing to, more to be done here except wait. My friends, Marla and Zemla, will look to Gwen. She'll be safe. Stenstrom didn't want to go. Come on, Belle. Gwen needs her rest. Let's get something to eat. You'll feel better. Then we'll return. So let's share with you some things we've seen, Aram said as he leaned over his lunch in the mess. This adventure has been remarkable, to say the least. All right, let's hear it, Stentrum said. Captain Duval, in the many places we've seen, is a madman. He was once a promising officer in the fleet, a hero even. Then he changed. The light about him seemed to fade. He went mad. It had something to do with his wife dying in an accident. Very tragic, actually. He wears a very convincing mask to cover that fact. A father of ten and a churchgoer. He's also a sociopath, a murderer, and an inner circle member of the Nilus of Punt, an ancient order. They exist outside the League, into Zaffin space and beyond. Their stated goal is the destruction of the universe so that a better, more perfect one can be created from the ashes of the old. He made frequent mention of something called St. Mary's Axe. I wasn't certain what he was talking about, Stenstrom said. It's his name for the Hall of Mirrors. That's where he encountered the Shadow Tech Goddess, Aram said. As a boy and a younger man, he had the ability to summon it to him whenever he wished, an ability he lost after the death of his wife. Captain Duval seems to think the Shadow Tech Goddess loves him. That he does. We've seen that a lot, and he hitches his wagon to anybody he thinks can help get him to her side. In this case, it's the Nilis Sapunt and Hannah Ben Sherlamp, Alesta said. Therefore, time is of the essence, Denstrom said. I suppose I could off the ship and double back to Cana while the Seeker, under Tara's command, continues on to the kills. Perhaps the professor won't expect that. Alesta smiled, the first time she'd smiled in a while. No need, Belle. We're going to get you down. How? How do you think? You mean the Marian's Road? Am I invited to walk your road? He was dumbfounded. He hadn't considered daring to ask to walk the Marian's road. He didn't believe it was his place to do so. Always, Belle, our star favors you, as do we. As Rami said, it's best if we proceed as covertly and quickly as possible. We have access to a wondrous method of travel that is completely undetectable. So why not use it? Our star acknowledges a good cause, and you have never pressed me to use it for your personal gain. So why don't we get started? Alesta took them through the hold and the Marians treated her with reverence as they passed, stopping what they were doing and honoring her with a silent nod. They also bowed to Stenstrom, who had given them this space, and at his home in Tyrol. 
mixed in here and there were some of his crew who had become involved with the members of their order, just as Alesta had become involved with Aram. They returned to the barn to check on Gwen. Wait here for a moment, Alesta said. She gave Aram a loving kiss on the cheek and then went in. She returned a moment later, her blue eyes wide with delight. Bell, come in here. He came in and there was Gwendolyn sitting up, coughing water out of her lungs. The Marians sat beside her, drying her off. Gwen! Stenstrom cried, rushing to her side. She looked at him for a moment, groggy, mouth open, without recognition. And then she smiled and put her hand on his cheek. Hey, Belle, she whispered. Looks like I'm out of uniform, huh? She coughed again. He took her hand and kissed it. God, Gwen, I thought you were gone. She winced. Ah, not so loud, please. My head. I don't remember much. I recall having breakfast with you in the, in the office. I recall discussing Aang and a, a, a call came in. I don't remember much after that except for a funny child's laughter coming from somewhere. That's, that's what I mostly remember, a child laughing. Was there a child someplace, Belle? No, Gwen, it was just a dream. She held her forehead. Oh, creation, my head hurts. You've had a severe trauma. You're going to need rest. Stenstrom leaned down and took her into his arms. She hugged him back weakly. Let me... Let me get up and get dressed for you. I'm a, I'm a mess. Where are my clothes? Weak, she tried to stand, but Stenstrom gently held her down. You're fine, Gwen. Just rest, all right? Will you do that for me? She lay back and relaxed a little. She took Stenstrom's hand. What's happening with Ing, Belle? Have you already discovered its location? Did, did I miss it? I haven't been down to Magravine yet. I've been a touch preoccupied. Gwendolyn spoke a little desperately. Well, I'm back, and I'm all right, though I'm probably not much help right now. I'm not feeling overly energetic. Gwen, don't worry about Magravine. Don't worry. I'm dying to learn where Ing is located. I've been I've been doing research and, and all sorts of things like that. I can picture it, even now. Gwen's eyes glazed over. Aram fetched a coarse blanket and draped it over her. Gwen was following into delirium. And uh, uh, I want to be introduced as Countess Gwendolyn of Belmont South. She fumbled with her watch. She drifted back into shallow sleep. Alesta adjusted her cover. I think she's going to be just fine, Belle. Just fine. How the star has blessed us. She just needs rest. I owe you much, Alesta. For this, you don't owe me anything, Belle. You two are my friends. Aram chimed in. Just promise to stand with her at our wedding once we finally get to it. A promise easily kept, Stenstrom replied. He stood and brushed the straw off his knees. Well then, I better go get a helmet and do this task at Magravine. Ing awaits. I don't want to disappoint her. Gwen babbled slightly as Alesta and Aram patiently listened. He asked me to marry him. Me, I, I have to make a better effort to show him how I... I love him. He's not a Zenon. He, he wishes that I display my love for him more openly. I, I must accommodate. I, I have to. She began to tear up a little. I wish I were you, Alesta, the way you are with Aram. That's how I am with Belle in my heart. I. She faded into restless sleep. He took a last look and left the barn, venturing through the ship back to his office. Tara was there. How's Gwen? Good. And getting better. I think she's going to be fine. She just needs a little time to rest. Let's make sure Lieutenant Zimitin is up to performing Gwen's duties while she recovers. Okay, Tara replied. What's our position? 9 a.m. of the Tamarack Cluster, about halfway to the kills. He picked up one of the Elder Helmets. He dreaded the thought of putting it on. He didn't want to see what it might have to show him. Oh, you're going to do it? Down at Magravine? I am, he replied. I don't want to, but what choice have I? He waited for Tara to protest or offer up a piece of unsolicited Baz common sense. She did not. He found that a bit odd. Aren't you going to try to stop me? Nope. Why not? She seated herself, put her feet up, and gave him an odd look. Because I need you to get this done so I can have my turn.
And with that, we conclude part two, chapter six, Buzzed. So as we see, Gwen was in pretty bad shape, was on her way to being dead. Alesta took her down to the Marion's hold at the bottom of the ship. And using water from the spring of Salon May on the planet Tremble, which is a Zaffin world, they put Gwen's head in it and allowed, allowed its mystical properties to heal and re restore her. The pool of Salon May is on the Isle of Zama, or the Garden of Zama as it's known, which is a floating rock which floats about 500 to a thousand feet above the the surface of Trimble, its its iron strata reflects the brindisite in Trimble's ore, so it's it floats like an island in the sky, but it's it's upside down in relations to Trimble. So if you're on the ground and the island comes floating overhead, you can see the surface of the island. You can see the little apple orchards and the the castle Sentinous Castle. You can see their death atorium. It's like an obelisk in the center. And then at the far end is this weird pool, the Pool of Salonme. And part of it is trickling off the edge of the of the island. And, that, and it starts falling to the, to the ground as like rain. And it's very, very mystical waters. We, we see the, the waters of Salonme in, in use in the Bloodstein books. If you've listened to those or read those books, we, we saw that the water of Salon May was, was instrumental in various things. I'm not going to go into much detail there, but, but that's where that water came from, was from Tremble. And apparently Gwen recovered. She's pretty tough, a little delirious at the moment, but seems like she's going to be good. Stenstrom goes and gets one of the helmets, and then next chapter heads down to Magravine. The next chapter is called Magravine. So we're going to find out what's at the bottom of the chasm at Magravine and see what's there waiting for him. Tara had a little heart to heart with Aram and he told her about the alternate version of Tara that's out there and she's way different, way different. And that book is probably my most R-rated book. There's a lot of sex in that book. I, you know, I just write what I feel needs to be written and that, and you know, smashing is a big part of that book. I, it is what it is. Anywho, we will find out what awaits Paymaster Stenstrom at Magravine next week. Part 2, Chapter 7, Magravine. That should be fun. Until then, this is Ren Presents. I'm your host, Ren. Peace out.